Thank you for the introduction. And as the slide shows, this is really going to be a whirlwind. Please don't expect to memorize everything or be able to feel comfortable with it all. I'm hoping this will just be an introductory workshop and you will have a chance to continue your education on LGBT health and health disparities after this. So, speakers. How's that? Oh my God, it's so much better for me. Good. Yeah, there you go. Is that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, in case it wasn't clear, I am also a lesbian. And I want to start by telling you a story. I want to give you a sense in general today about what it's like to be an LGBT person and what our healthcare experience have been like and how we, all of us on this call, can help make a difference in the future for LGBT people. But I want to start with a story. Um, as you were told in the introduction, in addition to running the National LGBT Cancer Network, I am also a psychotherapist, which means I keep odd hours. And I had a friend who I played tennis with for 15 years. Um, we became close friends, me and Adria, the person I played with for 15 years, as we chatted longer at the net as we were picking up balls. And it was at the net one of those times that Adria complained about feeling bloated and having pressure when she peed. And it was at the net a few months later that she told me that she was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. We played throughout her treatment and we played when she had a recurrence of cancer six months later. In fact, we played tennis, more talking at the net than swinging the rackets at this point, until six weeks before she died. And in that two and a half year period, between her diagnosis and her death, three more lesbian friends of mine were diagnosed with ovarian cancer and six friends were treated for breast cancer. So I ask you, what are the odds of that? Um, and as it turns out, we're not all at equal risk. Here's what we know about cancer risk and death. About 1.6 million people will be diagnosed with cancer this year, and about 577,000 people will die. But this is not the important data for most people. Most of us want to say, yeah, but what are my odds? And it turns out, as I said, that we're not at equal risk. Some of us, some groups of people, are carrying a disproportionate burden of the disease. And this is what's known as a health disparity. And I will be describing in detail a bunch of LGBT health disparities today. Um, the differences in the cancer risks and incidents are not a result of biological differences between LGBT bodies and our heterosexual sisters and brothers, but social conditions and differences in access to care. So health disparities are inequalities that should be avoidable because they're not biologically based. Um, so here's what I'm hoping we can cover today. As I said, it's just really um, a beginning. I have a problem about reading slides. I feel like you can read them faster than I can say them out loud. So I'm going to count on you to do that, sometimes giving you a second to do it. Um, so why should you learn about LGBT people? Because as I say here, there are too many of them to ignore. The Although, um, the census does not ask about LGBT um, status. We estimate that there are about 9 million LGBT people living in this country, or approximately the entire population of North Carolina. So let's try that on for a second. If I told you that the entire state of North Carolina had an increased risk of cancer and other diseases, wouldn't we be up in arms saying something has to be done? We would, and something does have to be done. But just to be clear, all the nation's LGBT people are not clustered in North Carolina or even on the two coasts or the major cities. According to the U.S. Census, which does look at couples, LGBT couples are present in 99% of the counties in the United States. That means they are absolutely in your neighborhood, too. Oops, done. Is the slide. Um, why don't you know who they are? Well, this is health disparity number one, what I'm calling invisibility, because you can't tell by looking who is LGBT, and most forms don't give us a chance to express either our real relationship status or our gender identity. So then I pose a question, um, does it matter? And, or as I say when I give presentations, is 
a lump, a lump, a lump? Or does it matter who that breast lump spent Valentine's Day with? I want you to think about it for a second. I think most people quickly say it doesn't matter, but I say it does. Let's explore that further. The surgeon who sees this patient may think it doesn't matter as, let's say, he will be doing the exact same surgery regardless of the patient's sexual orientation. But it is important for her to have her partner for support in the consultation before the surgery, at the hospital, and in her healing. The good surgeon knows this and asks about sexual orientation and invites the patient's support person or support system into treatment. Um, so why do we need to know who they are? As I said, it gives us a sense about people's real support system. And in many cases, it also tells us something about increased health risks about somebody. And I'll be covering some of that later. Um, we also know from research that those who do come out are more likely to continue treatment, get regular checkups, etc. And the last bullet point says that when people can't bring their whole selves, including their gender identity and sexual orientation, into the healthcare system, they either lie about who they are or, more dangerously for their health, they leave. So here what I'm saying is that it's your job to make it safe. The brave will come out, they always do, without your asking. But the more vulnerable we feel, and the sicker we may be, the more vulnerable we are, the riskier it is to be out. Let me give you an example from my own life about a surgeon who meant very well and who probably wanted to show me that she was comfortable with LGBT patients and probably meant to put me at ease during a medical emergency. A few years ago, after a night of no sleep, I woke up and realized I probably needed to have my appendix out. I called my best friend and said, grab a cab and meet me on the corner. We need to go to the ER. And my experience there was perfect, fast, friendly, and within an hour, a hip young surgeon was wheeling me down the hall to the operating room. Trying to put me at ease, she asked, is that woman you're with your partner? No, I said, feeling a bit exposed. She's my ex and my best friend. Oh, you lesbians are so great at staying friends with your exes, she said. Now remember at this point in my life, doing presentations like the one I'm doing now, I'm not just a lesbian professional, but I'm like a professional lesbian. And I was uncomfortable. I was horizontal with a skimpy hospital gown on, and I was about to be operated on. She was standing and dressed. When she continued to roll me into the operating room, she announced to the six people who were masked and waiting, she's here with her ex-partner. Aren't lesbians amazing how they stay friends with their exes? And I couldn't see the other people's faces well because of their masks. I didn't know who they were or how they felt about LGBT people. And I was about to be unconscious and have them go inside my body. Now remember, this was a simple laparoscopic appendectomy and it went fine. But it showed me how scary it is to be out. And imagine if I had a life-threatening illness like cancer, would I be willing without some guarantee of safety, to tell my oncologist something that could make him or her think poorly of me. It would be really hard to do so. So this slide shows you how scared people are and how hard it is for LGBT people to feel safe coming out to the people who treat them. Let me tell you another story. This one about a transgender woman I know. She ended up in the emergency room after jamming her pinky during a basketball game. And once there, the doctor asked her when her last period was. And she understood that they needed to know that she wasn't pregnant before they took an x-ray of her finger. But she also worried that if she told them, I'm transgender, I don't get my period, their focus would immediately leave her pinky and travel first to see if she had breasts and then down her body to see if there was a bulge in her crotch. After an internal debate with herself, she announced last week. So when you meet people, remember that most of them have not felt safe with their care providers knowing who they are. And imagine how different it can feel to be able to be their whole selves with you. Um, okay, now I want to go back. I mean, I've been saying LGBT, but I want to start defining what we really mean here. And Part of what's hard is that within LGBT are two very distinct categories. 
one sexual orientation, which includes lesbian, gay, and bisexual, and a second category called gender identity. And people have trouble telling the difference, and I will do my best to separate them, but remember it is difficult for most people. So we're going to start with sexual orientation, and that covers lesbian, gay, and bisexual, the LGB and LGBT. And as you can see here that these are in italics, identity labels for people who have sex or their primary romantic and relational ties to someone of the same sex or both sexes. And the important thing to remember here is that these are not descriptions of behavior, but identities. If we refer to everybody who had ever had sex at any point in their life with someone of the opposite sex and at some point in their life, someone of the same sex, nearly everybody would be bisexual. A lesbian may have had sex or even relationships with a man at some point in her life or even last week, but she feels that her attachments to women define her. So again, if someone tells you they're a lesbian, it doesn't mean that they have never had sex with men or relationships or loved a man. It says this is who they feel themselves to be. It's an identity. Now we're going to turn to gender identity. Gender identity refers to the persistent, meaning not passing, an ongoing internal sense of being a man or a woman. So we all have a gender identity. We all have an internal sense of whether we're a man or a woman. But for most of us, this matches the sex we were assigned at birth. When the doctor pulled us out and said, it's a boy, it's a girl, we probably still feel like that, the gender we were assigned at birth. But for some of us, our internal sense of ourselves does not match either our appearance, our body, or others' perceptions of us. So transgender people um, can decide to transition at any point in their lives. And some people have um, come out as transgender saying, deep inside, I feel like I am not the sex I was assigned at birth, even in um, senior housing. And there is a huge variation among transgender people in terms of the kinds of changes they choose to make or that they're able to make in their name, pronoun, and appearance. So transgender is what's called an umbrella term. It's important that you remember that not everybody chooses hormones or surgery. And actually, there are multiple possible surgeries that one can have, and they are all very expensive. A transgender man, um, now, let me start with this. A transgender woman, meaning someone who was assigned male at birth, may choose to have electrolysis, may choose to have her Adam's apple shaved, have a vaginoplasty, meaning the creation of a vagina. And because there are so many possible surgeries and procedures and hormones that someone can do, there's really no such thing as pre-op or post-op, although you do often hear someone say, is she pre-op or post-op? Also. Documents are very hard to change, and the rules for doing so vary state by state. I'm sorry, I don't know what they are in Texas, actually. So remember that you might meet a transgender person who has documents that do not reflect their true gender, but the one they were assigned at birth. Um, some people who are transgender actually believe that there are more than two genders. They don't, their internal sense of themselves is neither male nor female, but something that's either both or in between. Another term you might hear is transsexual. Um, transsexuals believe that they were born in the wrong body. They accept the binary system, that you are either male or female versus kind of both or somewhere in the middle, but feel that they are, in the, that they are the opposite sex from the one they were assigned at birth. And people who identify as transsexual will usually pursue every hormonal and surgical intervention that will bring their bodies more in line with their preferred or true sex. Um, but because there's so much variation among transgender people, you have to ask each person what it means to them to be transgender. And as I say here, ask people for the pronouns that they prefer and their names for their body parts. A transgender man, meaning someone who was assigned female at birth, might not have had top surgery, which would have removed breast tissue, but might bind his breast so that he appears to not. And very, more importantly, he might not call that area of his body, breasts, he might refer to it as his chest. So there are questions you might have to ask, and 
although this whole issue is fascinating, we really ask that you avoid unnecessary questions. So this is thinking on a continuum is not the usual way that people think about sex or sexual orientation, but it's actually more accurate. In other words, people don't always fit into two neat categories of sex, male or female, gender identity, or sexual orientation. In fact, we might place ourselves somewhere closer to center than the extremes. The new term that you see introduced here is DSD, which stands for Disorders of Sexual Development. And that refers to a group of conditions where either the reproductive organs or genitals do not develop normally, resulting in variations in sex anatomy or a mix of male and female characteristics. These people used to be called hermaphrodites, and then they were called intersex. DSD is the current word to describe this group of conditions. Genderqueer um, is, I didn't use the term, but I described it just before about people whose internal sense of themselves is neither male nor female, but something that's either both or neither. So again, I just want you to remember, it's not always obvious who is LGBT. The form's not going to tell you, and it is OK to ask. And it's perfectly OK to feel awkward as you learn to ask. I promise that by the fifth time you ask, um, the questions will roll off your tongue. As my Aunt Lee said, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly at first. And asking people what language they prefer for their partner, their gender, their pronouns, their body parts is something that's worth doing well and therefore worth doing awkwardly at first. OK, so here's my next question. Can I be fired for being gay? I'm not letting you answer. I'm asking you to think about it. But in most states in the country, the answer is yes. And the, on this map, you can see that Texas is a white state. Blue states um, ban discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And pink states have laws banning discrimination only on sexual orientation. Transgender people are not protected. So if you are not LGBT, you might not know this. But every LGBT person knows this. We know that we can be denied service in a hotel, thrown out of a restaurant, denied housing or a job because of our um, LGBT status. And this is the kind of scary way that LGBT people often live. Um, I want to talk for a second about discrimination and health because there is a relationship. Um, there was a study of lesbian, gay, bisexual, meaning only sexual orientation, not T, gender identity. So LGB respondents in states that did not have protective policies were, ready for this, five times more likely than those in other states to have two or more mental disorders. Another study found that LGB people who had experienced what they called prejudice-related major life events, like a hate crime of some kind, and it could be small, were three times more likely to have suffered a serious physical health problem over the next year than people who hadn't experienced such events. And this was true regardless of other factors like age, gender, employment, and even health history. And in one more study, after adjusting for age and race, lesbians and gay men who were in physical fights or were physically assaulted had much higher odds of being current tobacco smokers than their lesbian gay counterparts who did not experience those stressors. So yes, there is um, an important connection between um, discrimination and health. Um, in those studies, I cited only lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. This is a slide about transgender discrimination, which is, in many cases, far worse. I mean, these numbers are astounding to me. Nearly half of people who are transgender, according to the National Transgender Center for Equality, attempted suicide at some point in their life. Over half have been rejected by their families. Um, documents I spoke about that uh, people can't change them. And another really important thing, since we're talking about health care, is that 19%. That means about one out of five transgender people was turned away by a health care provider. The provider said, no, I cannot treat you. I do not understand your body. You have to go home or go elsewhere. Um, so let's look at some of the barriers to care for LGBT people. Um, 
there was a very large Harris Interactive poll in 2005 of many lesbians, most of whom were white, highly educated, and middle class, meaning a fairly privileged group of lesbians. And 75% of those people said that they avoided or delayed health care. The first reason was about money, lower income, the cost of it, or um, not having insurance coverage. LGBT people have much lower rates of insurance coverage. And the second reason cited in that Harris Interactive poll were previous negative experiences or feared um, discrimination in a healthcare setting. That kept people from pursuing um, necessary screenings or whatever they needed to keep themselves healthy. This is matched by a lack of provider information. Recent survey of medical schools found that um, most had less than five hours of education during an entire medical school curriculum on LGBT health, and most of that was on HIV. Now, the last bullet point here is to say not all LGBT people are the same. The, this may be one of multiple um, areas of discrimination or stigma that a person faces. For example, race, physical ability, citizenship, or being undocumented, etc. And we don't say which is worse or which trumps which, but that they are compounded. And so for people who have compounded um, barriers to care, they are less likely to take care of their bodies and seek medical care when they need it. Um, here are some other health disparities that I'm going to cover, and I'll go over each of these individually. Um, there's not a ton of research, but on these, we do have some that's helpful. Um, alcohol. There are a bunch of studies, and what all of them show is that um, alcohol and drug use, both in LGBT people, um, is dramatically increased and so is alcohol and drug abuse for all subpopulations. And the other thing we see is that in the rest of the population, alcohol use decreases with age, and that is not true for LGBT people. In some studies, alcohol abuse rates were three times higher than in the mainstream population. And according to a Pride Institute study, it was up to 45% higher. Just as a reminder, alcohol clearly raises the risk for cancers of the mouth, throat, voice box, and esophagus. Um, and smoking and drinking together um, increase the risks even more. Tobacco. Um, what we know about tobacco is that it causes at least 30% of all cancer deaths. And tobacco use in the LGBT population has been studied for some time. And each study confirms that our tobacco use is dramatically higher than the general population, up to twice the national rate. Why? Well, there are multiple reasons. But they include the fact that tobacco is a coping strategy for dealing with the stigma and harassment of um, being a sexual or gender minority. Bars are one of the few LGBT social outlets in some parts of the country, so it in encourages tobacco and obviously alcohol use. And finally, tobacco companies have directly targeted the LGBT community. And so many LGBT people see the tobacco industry as their friend because they've supported events. But the tobacco industry has targeted the LGBT community to sell more cigarettes in a program they called Project SCUM. Actually, it's an acronym for something, but it's so horribly offensive to me. Um, and now let's look at mental health. I had said something about that before um, in terms of um, states having um, bans for, against discrimination. Um, but most studies sh will show that LGBT people are at elevated risk for depression, anxiety, and suicidality they're almost two and a half times more likely to have had mental health disorders, especially mood and anxiety disorders. And to repeat what I showed before, 47% of transgender people have reported a suicide attempt. Just for comparison's sake, 1.6% of the general population has attempted suicide versus 47% of transgender people. And um, finally, cancer. I'm going to divide 
the section into three parts, cancer risks, cancer screening, and survivorship. Um, LGBT people as a group have dramatically um, higher cancer risk factors. Some of these we covered already, like tobacco and alcohol. And for lesbians, what we see is that a greater um, chance of having a high fat diet or a high body mass index and less likely to have had a biological child before age 30. That's what nulla parity is, which would offer some protection. So what we say is that lesbians have the densest cluster of risk factors for breast cancer. For um, gay men and transgender people, what we also see are very high rates of human papillomavirus, HPV, which leads to very high rates of anal cancer and, of course, high rates of HIV, which I can't really go into much since this is our whirlwind overview. Um, so if we're saying as a group we have dramatically higher risk factors, you'd think we need to be hypervigilant about screening. But instead, we find that it's coupled with lower screening rates, meaning as a group, we have fewer mammograms, cervical paps, anal paps, or colonoscopies than the general population. So what about cancer prevalence in LGBT people? Um, as I say, in the rest of my life, 2 plus 2 always equals 4. So I feel pretty confident that increased cancer risks coupled with decreased screening rates has to mean higher cancer incidence in LGBT people. But because no national cancer registries are collecting information about gender identity or sexual orientation, we remain hidden in that data. And we really need to know what it is. I mean, for example, we know that white women are more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer, but black women are more likely to die of it. And in terms of looking for funding, we also really need to have um, this information. It's hard to get funding for my organization when I can't prove that there's more cancer in our population, even though I am personally convinced that there is. Um, now, the, in California, their state um, health interview survey does ask about um, gender identity and sexual orientation, and LGBT people had 50 percent higher cancer rates than the general population there. Um, my organization recently completed an online survey of LGBT cancer survivors. And so we have some data from 311 survivors from across the country. Um, and what we learned about survivorship were that four things in particular. The first is that our sources of support are not identical to everybody else's. Many LGBT people have been kicked out of their families. As one person said, I might have that quote up for us on my next slide or something, um, my friends really were my support system. My biological family told me they hoped I would die of the cancer. So you have to really see who our support is when we're, especially if there's going to either be bad cancer news given or support through treatment and healing. There's also a lack of community support, meaning there are not enough LGBT support groups and caregiver groups for people. And people told us that they were desperate for information about how cancer impacts their sexuality, fertility, and LGBT relationships. The third thing is that there were a lot of complaints about how gendered the experience, especially of breast cancer, was. People complained about having pink thrust upon them and pressure to have a reconstruction following breast cancer surgery so that they would look good for men, that there wasn't a, a, a tailored look at what this population needed. And the last thing we saw that was that people really struggled about whether to come out or not, whether it was safe. And you can, I think I gave you a little hint of that when I talked about my own um, appendectomy story. So, I think cancer for LGBT people is the same as it is for everyone else, only it's scarier. There's an extra level here, layer of fear. So I am going to read these out loud because I want you to hear them. We may feel more vulnerable than other patients around issues of respect and compassion. Although my doctor knew all about me, each encounter with new people, with blood draws, ultrasound, breast x-ray, etc., had the basic anxiety of the procedure and layered onto that the possibility of homophobia and having to watch out for myself. 
I have been gay bashed and that makes me wary in institutional situations. Another person said, being LGBT can add additional stress to the whole cancer experience. Feeling like things can't be shared in general cancer support groups, misunderstanding among medical providers about roles of family members, existing strains in biological family due to coming out, partner issues during cancer, etc. This one really kills me. I believe my perceived orientation allowed my caregivers to give superficial care and my own latent shame allowed me to accept a quick and incorrect diagnosis of health. And the final heartbreaking quote I'm included here was, I was never out during the whole process to anyone. I had no one in the hospital or doctor visit me, visit with me for fear of my gayness being discovered and then the doctors accidentally not removing all the cancer lesions. It would have been nice to have my partner with me because she understands lots of medical things and I have no clue about medicine at all. My family refused to come and told me they hoped I would die from the cancer. Okay, well, I hope at this point I've convinced you that um, healthcare is extra frightening and difficult for LGBT people and there are many barriers. But there are some things that we can do. Um, and I want to go over some of that with you. Um, some people say, but it's only me. And as this slide says, I mean, it says it in the negative way. No single raindrop believes it's to blame for the flood. Even you, in the midst of the flood of um, discrimination or negligence, can make a huge difference. So even if you just change you, you will really help. Um, here are some things that you can do on an individual level, which is change your language. Um, it, say, what they found is that the easiest way is to just say, so is your partner, is he or she in the waiting room today? Just open it up that it's a possibility. And very importantly, mirror the language that people use for themselves and their body parts and their partners. If someone calls her person her wife, you say wife, girlfriend, lover, partner, significant other, whatever she says, you say. And if you get it wrong, don't worry about it. It happens all the time. Just give a quick, I'm sorry, and move on. Um, because LGBT people come with um, a lot of negative experiences previously, we often scan when we walk in someplace to see, is it safe for me? So you want to give that information, it's safe here, as quickly as you can. And a rainbow pin or sticker says that immediately. It kind of says, you know, gay spoken here. And in order for people to come out to you, you have to let them know that it's safe. Explain what your confidentiality rules are. And again, this is really just a beginning. You need to read more, um, learn about LGBT families and more about health risks and think about forming a study group. That's a great way to share your learning. Um, here are some ways of how to ask different kinds of questions. What name would you prefer I call you? Are you in a relationship? Um, who's part of your support system? Don't assume that young people have a mother and a father. They might have two fathers and or two mothers. Um, these are organization level changes that you could make. As I said, provide something in the waiting room because that's where people start. It's very easy to have LGBT literature sitting out. And if you have magazines, you can get your local LGBT paper or magazine. You can get some for free. It won't even cost money. But it tells the frightened LGBT person, I'm safe here. And remember to um, be very loose about how you define family and invite them all in. The other thing is when you have to make referrals, you want to make sure that the place you are referring your patient or client to is also some place where they will feel safe. So you need to make sure that either your referral list is LGBT cultural competent or develop a list of culturally competent referrals. And this can, needs to be updated regularly, like annually. Um, post and enforce a non-discrimination policy. Everybody loves to see that. And then um, Make sure that it includes gender identity, not just sexual orientation. The other thing is to hire LGBT staff because that's really how people want to see their people are being employed here too. It's another way to help people feel safe. 
And if you begin to collect data on LGBT patients, you can contribute to the research which we so desperately need. Um, this is, as I keep saying, I am racing through because I know we're supposed to end at quarter of, but I would recommend that all of you get a copy of the field guide, which you can get online through the Joint Commission, because it goes through um, everything that you could do to make your organization and your facility and your practice um, LGBT safe, welcoming, and culturally competent. And it's available at www.jointcommission.org. And that just came out last November, so it's actually almost a year old. If you want more information on cancer in particular, I would recommend that you go to my organization's website where we have a, a pretty good size library of information on cancer in the LGBT community. Also, feel free to write to us and ask any questions or information or to send you to somebody or whatever you need, please remember we're here to help. And I know you already heard at the beginning about the LHI Health Fair on Saturday, November 3rd, but this is how you can find out more information, www.lhihouston.org or write info at lhihouston.org and find out more. So summing up my whirlwind um, overview, imagine that there are LGBT patients everywhere. And if you don't know that and you're not seeing them nearly every day, it's because people haven't felt safe to bring their whole selves to you. And I think, and it's important that they do bring their whole selves so that you know who their support system is and you can understand what their health risks might be. And it's not gonna be obvious by looking. And this might be new, it might be a review for some of you, but for those of you for whom some of this language is new, please allow yourself to be uncomfortable and allow that it's awkward at first, but it's worth persevering and moving on. Now I'm gonna take a breath and I'm open to any questions you might have for me. Is there a way that people can use their microphones and ask, or should they type them? Hi, Liz. Thank you. Well, again, we think that this is not a result of any biological or physiological difference between the brains of LGBT people and our um, heterosexual sisters and brothers, but really we're seeing the long-term impact of stress and discrimination and stigma. What's different about growing up LGBT as compared to growing up in other kinds of cultures is that most people have people like them at home. So if you are the only, let's say, non-white family in a primarily white neighborhood, at least when you go home, you're with your people. For LGBT people, coming out often means separating yourselves from your family. I don't mean physically or geographically, but realizing that you're different. And people carry this around and wonder whether it's safe to tell other people they might lead a double life. All of this is very stressful. Not to mention, as I showed with some of the statistics, um, actual incidents of discrimination not only keep us from the healthcare system, but can cause major health problems, in addition to leading to more tobacco and alcohol use. But yes, depression and anxiety, too, and suicidality.
Great question. And I, as far as I know, the answer in that particular case is no. But there are people working to add um, questions about gender identity and sexual orientation to the largest health survey in the country, which is the National Health Information Survey. And we will have LGB on there, meaning sexual orientation, not gender identity, um, I, starting in um, 2013. And every five years, that survey, NHIS, includes information about cancer. So we will ultimately get some of those. Um, the transgender question they decided is just too hard. I mean, they, they, you can't believe how long the feds could spend figuring out how to word the question so that people would answer. They used to fear people wouldn't answer these, but research shows they don't stop when they get to that question. People will answer it. It just has to be worded right. For example, lots of people who are heterosexual don't know that that's the name for their sexuality. So they have to be worded well, but we will in the next few years get more information about cancer in the LGBT um, community. Wait, I see one here. Do, uh, um, well, I think participation in cancer support groups is down for every population. And I think it's partly because people are healthier as they're going through it and there are options like online groups, etc. cetera. Um, there are some LGBT support groups, and many people prefer that. Um, and like you can imagine, if there's like a breast cancer caregiver group, which is filled with boyfriends and husbands, it might be hard to be the only woman lesbian partner in that group. But our survey found that people really need LGBT support, and there is just not enough. I would think about starting one if you don't already have one in your area and um, offer it to everybody S speak to if it's a mixed group find out if the group facilitator is aware of lgbt cancer issues and feels like she can have this be a safe place for someone else to join um, Let's see, how is this? How about CEs for nurses docs on talking to their LGBT patients during cancer care screening? Um, there is no such thing yet. Let me say that it, things are really moving, but we don't have such things yet. My organization does trainings, as you heard in the introduction, we wrote the curriculum and we do train the trainer trainings for the staff in, um, all of the New York City municipal hospitals, which covers 38,000 employees. The beauty of that is that we need to not just train nurses and social workers and doctors. We need to also be training um, clerical workers and the security guard. If you think about going into an emergency room, before you see your culturally competent doctor, you've probably interacted with five other people. And I assure you, many LGBT people have already given up and left. So everybody must be trained. And uh, it is not the Joint Commission, which put out that field guide, stopped short of making it mandatory. The Joint Commission is the um, federal program that accredits hospitals and healthcare systems. And while they encourage everybody becoming cult LGBT culturally competent, as I said, they stopped short of making a making it a requirement. But I think you can look around and probably find some online training program somewhere. And I would suggest maybe you look at um, Fenway Health is starting to offer CEUs for, it's just LGBT cultural competence and healthcare, not cancer-based. I see one more, do I have time to answer it? It's about um, disorders of sexual development. I see someone answered it down here. That's what DSD stands for. People who either their physical genitals or their chromosomes are neither perfectly male nor perfectly female. And um, 
the people who have this condition are often given multiple surgeries immediately to make their bodies and then later hormones make keep their bodies um, conforming to either one sex or the other. But because this is becoming also a more politicized group, some people object to the first D standing for disorder, and they want it to be referred to as differences of sexual development, meaning it's not, there's nothing um, pathological or dangerous about having, let's say, a very small penis if you're a boy or a very large clitoris if you're a girl. We don't need to fix it. Oh, absolutely, and don't hesitate to ask me anything. Perfect. Um, we don't really know. There's no research that says that. But because we know that hormones are implicated in many kinds of cancer, I am concerned. But I can't really say that. I think what we, what we have found is that um, transgender women who mean they were assigned male at birth and often take estrogen have lower rates of prostate cancer. But yes, if somebody, if a trans woman is taking estrogen and has uh, breast implants, she should absolutely still have mammograms. Thank you. Bye.